Mr. Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Well in today's video it's onto the slide bars. I'm going to be covering what a slide bar is, a bit of milling and I'm going to be pointing out a few things. Also at the end of today's video I've got some details on where you can find those piston ring articles that I mentioned in an earlier video. Well to kick off, what is a slide bar? Well no, it's not the one you get at Aldi that has nuts and caramel in it. It does however have nuts on it and it looks something like this. So here is a slide bar and what on earth does that do? Well to give this some context let me show you a book that I was given by a friend of mine John Chambers. Now this nicely depicts an example of the locomotive I'm building. And yes, I know, there's quite a few parts to go, but hopefully in this picture you'll recognise some of the components I've been working on recently, namely the cylinder block. There's my one, and there you can see where it fits in uh, real life. Now from the cylinder block can be seen the slide bar. So picture the scene. You have a piston rod moving in and out in a reciprocating fashion. And further down here, you have a rotary motion of the crank going round. Now, where those two motions converge, you require a pivot. And that pivot is provided just here in a component called the crosshead. So as the piston rod is sliding in and out, you have the crosshead attached to it. And within the crosshead is the pivot about which... The crank is operating so you have that assembly now as that pivot is working there's a natural tendency for the components at the ends where they meet to try and do this that of course is not good for the cylinder because it would cause binding of the piston so to counter these forces the slide bar exists now this is a piece that is retained both at the cylinder end on the cylinder head and also on the chassis by means of this hanger. So it's retained in two places and it forms a very stable slide bar for the crosshead to ride in and out of. So it's fairly straightforward. It is effectively a rail for the crosshead to slide in and out and the crosshead is where this motion is forming. An interesting fact about the slide bar and crosshead motion is that when the locomotive is running forwards the tendency of this motion is for it to push upwards. That's when the locomotive is running forwards the forces are going upwards and you'll notice as I go through the design that this is quite a lot beefier at the top than the bottom both in terms of the slide bars design and its actual retention to the locomotive. So with that said, let's consider some of the manufacturing details. Now this is what I call a plate assembly. You have one piece, two, three, four and potentially five pieces stacked on top of each other and bolted together. Now a typical approach to this is to split it into its component bits and manufacture each piece individually and then bolt them all together at the end. Now that's quite an effective technique if you are trying to mass produce these. Uh, you can batch the components up and make 25 of each and bolt them together at the end. Also, if I could get the material in in the required cross-section, so let's say I could buy material in, in this cross-section and in this cross-section, I could actually order the material in and then all I would have to do is cut the ends and put the holes in. That would be another good example of how making these pieces individually and bolting them up would work well. Now, I only require two of these and I don't have any material that is already in the correct cross-sectional dimensions. So I'm going to tackle this a slightly different way and the main driver behind the method I've chosen here is the finished result. These are quite prominent components and when you have lots of edges like this all against each other it becomes very obvious when there are errors. So if the edges don't quite line up or if one piece is wider than the other or if things aren't quite adjusted right it becomes very obvious to the eye that there are inaccuracies. So I'm going to pursue a route that gives me an inherently nice result and hopefully that's what will transpire. So I'm going to get straight into this. Uh, now the features drawn in green are things that I'm hanging on with for now. Here you can see an oil hole 
Uh, I haven't quite decided exactly how I want the lubrication for this slide bar and cross head assembly to work yet. If you have any good ideas on how that could be done, then do let me know and I'll consider them. Uh, equally, you can see here a design feature that I believe to be dirt traps. So as this cross head is travelling back and forth, should any dirt land on the slide rail, it is pushed down, it drops over the edge and it falls into this trough. That keeps it out of the way and stops the crosshead dragging dirt back and forth on the slide rails. Now that's a simple but effective design technique. I think it would still work in model size, so I'm inclined to include them. These are often omitted from models, but seeing as they form an actual function, I uh, hope to include them. I'm not quite brave enough, however, to try and work out where exactly the ends of the crosshead will land at this stage. There aren't really enough dimensions on these drawings to do so. So I'm going to leave them off for now and perhaps at a later date when I can mark off the actual crossheads I may put them in. But those do exist and uh, they're worth pointing out. So I'm going to tackle these now. I haven't yet mentioned what material these are going to be made from. Well they're going to be made of what I call gauge plate. Some call it ground flat stock, it's a type of tool steel. Uh, compared to your average mild steel, this has more carbon. It allows it to be heat treatable and it's generally a lot tougher. Now, one nice thing here could have been to buy this in the cross sections as I mentioned earlier that you require. If you go to Coventry Gauge Plate, they will grind you, you know, uh, whatever profile you want, and then you can buy it and just chop it up. This is ground, but only on the width. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by band sawing the required shapes out. So I will not be touching the widths, I will just be sorting the edges out. And I will then show you my method for how I'm going to build these plate assemblies. I have been to the band saw and I've cut two 1 8 pieces at the shorter length, two 3 16 pieces at the shorter length and two 3 16 pieces at the longer length. I have then taken a file. I've broken all the edges and I've used some emery cloth just to give it a quick once over. This leaves the material in a condition where I can carry out a quick check before I begin. And what I really want to know is um, how flat it is and whether there's any surface defects. You can see here I've got a scratch and I'm going to consider these errors when I decide how to stack the components up. Some of you may have guessed on the basis of this, how I'm going to approach this uh, machining operation, the rest of you will find out soon. But for now, what I'm doing is, I'm, as I said, checking the flatness. Now, to check the flatness uh, of a piece, well, Robin Renzetti is the actual expert on this. I'm just playing at it. But basically, when you pivot it like this, you can see that all the motion is pivoting about one end. If I reverse the component, the piece is now pivoting about the middle. So that tells me that the piece has a slight bow and that the convex side is down, the concave side is up. So it's pivoting about the uh, midpoint of the convex bow. If I reverse it, the two ends of the concave are now on the table and with a one thou feeler gauge I can examine exactly how much that error is. Now you can see there that's uh, I'd say the error there is less than a thou. So I'm not going to try and correct this error. I'm just going to bear it in mind when I stack the components up and uh, choose which way around to put them. So hopefully that made sense. Now I just wanted to finish this little demonstration with showing you something that is very flat. So here's a piece of the 1 8 thickness and this is very flat. As I move it, you can see it's pivoting roughly here. Now, as I said, Robin Renzetti is the expert. I seem to recall that you're looking for the pivot point to be a third of the way in. So in the middle with regards to this dimension and a third of the way in on the overall length opposite to the end you're moving. And you can see there that it's pivoting about a third of the way in. So that is a very flat piece. So I mentioned that within this component runs a piece called the crosshead. Now the crosshead mounts in the middle of this and it has two tangs that run down either side of these rails. So the cavity that is created in the middle here has a tang running in it and that is the motion of the crosshead within the slide bar. Now considering that running motion and the fact it needs to be well supported and considering the way I've uh, examined the bow in these plates, what I'm going to do is I'm going to position them so that the bows are both inwards. That will hopefully allow some amount of 
um, support and compare that to if I mounted them the other way around I'd be having less support. So that is just my uh, general idea on which way around to mount these components but we are of course talking about very small amounts of bow. I have made my decisions and now it is over to the milling machine. Crispin, have you seen my toothbrush? No, no I haven't. I can't find it anywhere. Well, have you tried double checking your wash bag? Not yet, no. Ah, well I suggest you start with that. <clears throat> Here at the Decal FP1 I am going to proceed with my clamping setup for the first operation. Now should you own a mini pallet, which is one of those fancy blocks with all the drilled and tapped holes in it and the nice little clamps to suit, this would be a good time to use it. In lieu of one of those, however, I am going to do the following. I have taken a piece of plain old hot rolled steel and I've given it a draw file up. I've got it nice and parallel and flat and that is going to be a sacrificial piece. I'm placing that roughly in the middle of the table and onto it is going the stack of gauge plate that I assembled at the surface table. Now I am straddling a T-slot here, not because I want to, but because for the subsequent operations I need to clamp from both sides and so I need it in the middle of two T-slots. So it's going right here and uh, roughly speaking for now that's where it's going to go. I then bring some clamps in and I'll start with the middle one. I'm going to clamp it using uh, another clamp as the riser block at the back. And that's going in the middle. Now um, there is a few compromises here. The main one being that the stud is much further towards the back of the clamping arrangement than the component. I prefer to get the stud closer to the component than the riser. But as I said, when you're only dealing with the big T-slots and not the mini pallet, you have to... Um, make some compromises here and there but this will do the job fine so I'm going to get that snug it up a little bit okay and then bring my uh, remaining clamps in bearing in mind of course where the cutter and spindle are going to be and making sure there's clearance for those things to happen. To begin, I am cleaning up the end face. As I explained, you have to carefully arrange the clamp so they don't hit the spindle or cutter. Well, uh, I think I'm going to have to rearrange very slightly here. Okay, now that was of course a planned demonstration just to show you what can happen and how you have to rearrange the clamp sometimes. So now that I've carried out that little exercise, I will carry on. I will now bring these faces to the required lengths, measuring from here. Okay, we'll see where we are. 
Okay, eight hour to go, so I'm going to continue working away on these ends and I'll show you when I'm finished. Working away on the ends here and there's something I want to point out. Clearly for both this face and the face I'm going to be machining here, I want the face to be fully cleaned up. And that has been achieved so far, all round here, by lowering the cutter to a depth where it cuts into the sacrificial piece such that the bottom of the cutter is below the bottom of the gauge plate and I get a nice fully cleaned up surface. That's not possible here however as I don't want to dig in to this section which is a finished face so I'm using the standard paper trick. I've got a piece of normal A4 paper here, 4 thou thick. I'm going to bring the cutter down until it whisks it away at which point I'll know the cutter is 4 thou off the finished surface roughly. I will then drop the table, or raise the table, probably two and a half, three thou, and proceed to clean this face up. That will leave me a very thin section of the uh, metal removed, uh, which I will then lose in the break edge. So uh, you'll see how all this transpires later, but I thought I'd just point that out. The table's coming up, and there we are. So I know now that I'm approximately four thou off that surface, so I'll bring the table up another three. With the datum corner and end work done, I'm moving on to my second clamping arrangement. And for this, some more pieces of aluminium packing are coming in overhead. And then I'm going to mirror the clamping arrangement this time however with only two clamps such that I can get in the gaps between the existing clamps and I'm taking care to align the clamps in such a way that I can free the other pieces of aluminium packing and clamps once these are tight So I currently have five clamps that are tight and what I'm going to do obviously here is remove these three so the workpiece will not have moved position because it's now being retained by these two but I can get rid of these clamps which will in turn give me access to my uh, front edge and the holes that are required and as ever I'm going to check that that's still well held, so I'm going to now take this to overall width. Well I'm not sure about you but I got totally fed up of this uh, squirting bottle. So I've carried out some adjustments and now you should witness the full effects of the inbuilt coolant system. Feeding back the other way with a 1000 climb cut to take it to finished width. Okay, well I've got a highly parallel result and I'm at finished width, so that's very good. I did just want to mention something quickly about clamping arrangements, and that is to say that you would probably not get away with this clamping arrangement in all scenarios. If this were a solid piece, then quite possibly this would be a fine clamping arrangement, but remember this is a stack of three pieces, and basically if I pinch her down in two places, by the time I get to the top there's going to be a tendency for this end to raise slightly, this end to raise slightly, and possibly if you had a, a stack of really thin parts, the middle might even raise slightly. So you'd end up with a sort of waveform with the low two points being where the clamps are. I am currently hovering above my first hole and I'm going to do a mixture of centre drilling, drilling and reaming where appropriate.
this is one of the few times you'll see me peck reaming. Normally I go through in one go, but um, being a small diameter and a blind hole, you can't afford to too much swarf to build up at the bottom, um, thus not allowing the reamer to um, get to full depth. Some may be wondering why on earth I'm reaming these bolt holes, but all will become clear very soon. And after this reaming is finished, it's on to the next setup. Just a quick point on reamers before I move on. You saw me there use a drill chuck to do the centre drilling and drilling and then I had to swap the spindle apparatus and use a reamer to put the holes in. Well it would have been handier if I could have used what's known as a hand reamer because obviously I could have used the same drill chuck so no changing of the spindle apparatus required. However there's an important difference and if you're a beginner this may be something for you to take note of. A hand reamer starts with a taper and I have some bigger examples here to demonstrate. Here is a hand reamer. Now I'm not sure if you can see but basically from about here to here there is actually a tapered grind and this allows the reamer to start and center itself and, and that is the typical profile of a hand reamer. It has a leading taper. The equivalent machine reamer, however, which typically would have a taper shank, has its cutting edges at the front only. Once you get past those chamfered cutting edges, you are into the full diameter of the reamer immediately. So for an application like this, where I'm going down to a blind hole, it's very important that the reamer forms the full diameter right from the end. So I allowed myself a couple of mil extra just to get the chamfer of the reamer into the uh, sacrificial piece and everything else was the full diameter. Moving on and there is one more operation I need to perform while the component is in this orientation and that is to put a quarter inch slot down the middle that runs to approximately here and it goes through the full depth of the first piece. So it's a quarter inch slot, 3 16 deep running to about here. Now naturally, if I split the top that far, it's going to give the ends of the component quite an ability to flex like this. So my clamping arrangement is going to be set up to counter that. Equally, the clamping arrangement is going to be set up to allow the cutter access. Clearly how it is at the moment, I can't really get a cutter down there. So here's my uh, plan. I'm bringing a clamp in from the end to pincer the... Um, end of the workpiece now as ever I'm checking to make sure that I have a slight downward angle it's okay so the end of the component is pincered and now I need to somehow clamp these edges such that they stay where they are and to do this I have made up a couple of special packing pieces and these sit on the corner and they give me a rough indication of how far in from the edges the clamps can come and with them in place in come the clamps okay so with that all snugged up on the attachment I should now be able to remove these two and give them a quick clean down and rearrange them. getting something like a clamped component now I 
So a couple of key points because once I actually mill through this I'm dealing with some quite fragile or not fragile but flexible sections. So the first thing is to consider how much of a downward angle you have. You do not want much of an angle either way because once these ends become free from the material holding them together too much of an angle could encourage the piece to move one way or the other so it's pretty much almost parallel to the bed so it's purely squashing down with no um, forces side to side. Also I'm not sure if you can see but I have filed all the ends of the clamp square. Typically when you look at a clamp it has a corner radius and that's normally quite useful. It stops the part digging in too badly and uh, it's handy to have a radius on there. Uh, the problem with that is in this scenario however that that radius moves your clamping point to a rather unpredictable area and you could end up clamping the component right on the back and inducing more of a rolling motion. I want the clamping forces right down on the middle of what section is going to be left. So uh, to give me some predictable contact points I have filed all the faces of the clamp square thus removing the corner radius. Okay so I'm happy with that and I'm now going to install a milling cutter. Now in case you've been skipping through the video and you've just arrived at this point um, yes there is actually a component in there somewhere you can just about see the end of it here. So that's the finished slot. Now the methodology for doing that was to start with a 3 16 cutter right in the middle of the piece and come down in three depths until I had roughed the whole slot the full length and to full depth. I then stepped over to this side, cleaned this side up till nearly finished size. I stepped over to this side, cleaned that up till nearly finished size and then I did one final pass as a full uh, sweep round. That's that and I'm now going to take the second stack of plates to exactly the same size. Uh, now I very nearly tried to do this like that. So leave the, uh, the full length and then try and machine the whole lot in one go. Would have saved quite a few uh, setting up and uh, size finding operations. However the gauge plate wasn't quite long enough to do that and I would have well and truly run out of clamps. Slide bars so far and after one set up each that is what I have. I'm going to call it quits for part one. Uh, not about 90% of the work here is done so in part two I will be showing you how I finish these off. I will be explaining why I bothered to ream those bolt holes and I will be finishing things off nicely ready to mount these onto the cylinders. Okay so that's quite enough for one day. Now if you want to find these piston ring articles unfortunately you're going to have to buy them. I uh, did see and it would appear the copyright is still active so I can't really just share any documents or give you a link to someone who's photocopied them. You are going to have to buy them. Uh, what you need to do is go to the Strictly IC website that's uh, Strictly I See, the magazine, they have a website and what you're looking for is issues 7, 8 and 9. In those is the article by George Trimble titled The Design and Fabrication of Piston Rings. Also, a few people commented saying, uh, did I not want to share the workings of Professor Chaddock? Uh, now, Professor Chaddock was an English model engineer and amongst many other things he did document uh, some piston ring manufacture notes. Uh, now by all means go and find those. I'm sure someone in the comments can tell us which back issues of Model Engineer to look in. Um, but actually George Trimble did cover 
the works of Professor Chaddock as he went through his experiments, so Trimble is a bit of a one-stop shop. That's all I have to say for today, so hopefully you found that interesting. Thank you for watching, see you on the next video. As for me, it's time to fix Brother's toothbrush. Have you double checked your wash bag? You can see where the brains went in this family. Aha! Uh -huh. Double check the wash bag, eh? You can see where the brains went in this family.